All right, can folks see that? I know it's got the sort of the preview, the next slide. Can everybody see the the main slide? I can see the main slide. Everybody good? Yep, we I can see it. it. Great, great. great. <laughs> All right, so good morning. Welcome to the deep dive on, um, on WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Um, we're thrilled that you're all joining us this morning. Um, we will try to make this um, as as informative as possible. Um, there is a lot of material to go through. Really want to um, thank Chris for pulling it all together. He is our resident WIOA expert. Um, additionally, we have the good fortune of having our agency partners, SBS and DYCD, um, Department of Small Business Services and Department of Youth and Community Development, who administer the RIOA funds joining us today and they will present um, their agency's work. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, get to the agenda. I think. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go through um, purposes and objectives. Then we're gonna do some background on WIOA um, because this is a version of a longstanding commitment of the federal government to support um, employers and job seekers. We're gonna give you a snapshot of the current WIOA programs and that's where the agencies are gonna go through in detail um, what's happening with WIOA um, now and what they're anticipating in the near future. We'll also discuss sort of roles and expectations of the Workforce Development Board as well as members of the board and council. Um, we also wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what's happening with WIOA reauthorization um, and then we'll discuss next steps in Q&A. We go to the next slide. Um, so again, purpose and objective. So wanted to sort of lay out like, why are we here this morning on this lovely hot August 1st morning? Um, one is we owe us such a key, um, a key element of the work that we do. Um, it is the largest um, federal funding that the city gets that's really dedicated to talent and workforce. Um, additionally, the law, the federal law, gives local workforce development boards oversight of these funds. So that's the role of the New York City Workforce Development Board. Um, additionally, the city agencies administer these funds. So we wanted to make sure you all understood and knew the city agencies as well as sort of the, understand a bit about um, legal procurement um, and sort of the, 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 the rules that we have to follow as a city. Um, and then we really hope that, you know, by the end of this call, we've done a good job to sort of level set, because I know some of you on the call have a deep, deep understanding of WIOA and how it works. Um, and then other of you, others of you, this is new to you. So we really want to make sure we're positioning all the council members to help make informed recommendations about how to use WIOA, what it can be used for, what it can't be used for, and then really position board members to understand um, what your oversight role is. Um, and how we're really excited about this partnership. So if we go to the next slide, just to ground everybody, and I know you've all seen um, both these objectives as well as the recommendations from the Future of Workforce, um, um, Future of Workers Task Force. So these these are what are our guiding principles. So we have these objectives, they're in the executive order, they're just good sense when it comes to talent and workforce development. If we do all these and achieve these and these objectives, we as a city will be thriving and we'll be thriving in a way that has shared prosperity and an inclusive economy. And then many of you sat on the Future of Workers Task Force and helped us think through what are some of the key things we need to do um, so that we as a city have the infrastructure in place for the public and private partnerships that are super necessary to really achieve these objectives. And as many of you know, one of those recommendations was really reinvigorating and empowering the Workforce Development Board and the Council. Um, so we're thrilled to be here today. Um, if we go to the next slide. I should add my slide. Um, so public-private partnership. You can't do talent and workforce without it. We need employers to hire people and we need employers to be good employers in terms of the wages and the opportunities that they provide. And we need to make sure New Yorkers and job seekers are in a good position to not only access, um, but to secure and thrive in those jobs. 
Um, so one of the things the Adams administration has done is really prioritize how do we do these public-private partnerships. And so based on the recommendation of the Future Workers Task Force, we established the Workforce Development Council and reinvigorated the Workforce Board. And here are a few things that we think are sort of critically important that, um, that you all and that we all do together. Um, so we sort of talk about serving as a center of gravity. So for the strategic conversations, solicit feedback so we're consistently improving our system. So making sure in this case that we're really um, using WIOA as effectively as possible, leveraging additional resources as needed um, so that we can really achieve the citywide objectives. We also wanna make sure that we all understand the needs of job seekers and particularly those that have been facing barriers to employment. Because as we know, while we as a city have been able to reduce those disparities, um, we announced recently you know, the, the um, black and Latino unemployment rate under the Adams administration has actually come down by 30%. It is still disproportionately high and two or three times higher than the white unemployment rate. So for instance, that's one of the areas or we recently are about to today announce more of our work around people with disabilities because again, they face so many barriers to employment that we want to knock away. Um, super important um, to really understand the labor market changes. So we're looking to all of you who have your top in, in your industries and in your firms about what's happening and what do you anticipate happening in labor markets so we can really understand the needs of employers and adjust the workforce system and how we use WIA. And then last, um, making sure we're responding to real time events. So what we're seeing in terms of the lasting impacts of the global pandemic, the growth of IDIA and climate change. So that's the context in which we're having this conversation. And just a little bit more in terms of like what, how, how this works. Um, so as I think many of you know, our team, NYC Talent, staffs the board and council and their subcommittees. We also staff an interagency talent cabinet. So what we try to do is make sure we are good partners to, to both everybody on the council and board and the committees, but also to our agency partners so we can make sure that public-private partnership just doesn't sit with one mayor's office or one place, but really helps support the whole system. Um, the New York City, as I said before, the New York City Department of Small Business Services and the Department of Youth and Community Development administer and deploy the WIOA resources through their programs and investments following the city's procurement process. And they'll speak a little bit about that in today's presentation. And last, we you know, again, the resources from the WIOA program are sort of a critical, critical tool um, around our, our twin goals of ensuring that, you know, all New Yorkers are well positioned to access and thrive in good jobs and that New York City employers have access to qualified diverse talent they need to grow and, and thrive and succeed. So that's sort of the context. Um, we are now going to go deep into um, background on WIOA. And with that, um, it's the person who is best suited and um, really is a, an incredible resources to our office, but to the city overall and to all of you going forward is Chris Neal. He's the director of the Workforce Board um, and has been, been really supporting and, and leading this work um, for many years now. So um, I'm pleased to turn it over to him to really get into the nitty gritty of WIOA. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Abby. Uh, good morning, everybody. And again, sorry for some of the, the technical difficulties. Um, appreciate having you all here. As Abby said, some of you are well-versed in WIOA. And for some of you, WIOA is a, is a pretty new thing. So we're trying to help refresh our returning members' understanding of WIOA and provide some new information for the new council and board members. Um, so I'm going to talk about the law itself and what's required and a number of different elements of how we have to implement it locally. Um, so it is a federal law. It was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Obama back in 2014. Um, the U.S. Department of Labor is the federal agency responsible for overseeing its implementation across all states and territories. And the law really has it has a number of objectives, but there's sort of three objectives that I want to highlight. Um, and they have to do with helping individuals, helping employers, and building a stronger system. So one of the things that we always strive to do is to really provide access to a mix of employment, education, training, supportive services 
to individuals to help them succeed in the labor market. Um, and WIOA places a particular emphasis on individuals with barriers to employment, barriers or things like you have justice involvement or you have a disability or you're an out of school, out of work young person. So there's a particular emphasis there. Um, the next objective is really about supporting employers and making sure that local areas like New York City really help uh, build and supply the skilled workforce that employers need to uh, succeed and thrive in a global economy. And then finally, there's an element of building a system. And WIOA explic explicitly intends to build a stronger workforce development system throughout the United States, but it also envisions that states and local areas like New York City build their own strong systems for preparing workers and connecting them to employers. Um, there's three traits that I want to highlight uh, about WIOA, about this legislation. Um, number one, it's designed to be a demand-driven workforce development system. That means that there's a strong focus on what employers need. What is their demand for workers? And how do we make sure that we are both uh, equipping folks with the right skills and experience and then helping connect them? to the job opportunities that employers have in our regional economy. Another trait is uh, that WIOA really emphasizes coordination and alignment of workforce development services. Um, there are requirements on the board, but you know we really take the spirit of this to heart. As you know, we have both CUNY and the New York City Public Schools on our board. We have lots of partners that are employers. We have um, business serving employers like the partnership for New York City. Uh, so we're really trying to make sure that we are aligning and coordinating across a variety of different services. The final trait I want to highlight is that WIOA provides local control, a lot of latitude to officials administering programs. There are certain roles for the feds, there are certain roles for the state, but there is a fair amount of control that we have at the local level. Okay, so I want to put WIOA funding in context. We're going to talk about this in more detail in a little bit, but approximately our, our budget this year, fiscal year 2025, which started on July 1st, New York City has about $100 million in WIOA, in WIOA funds. Um, by contrast, the, the city also invests another billion dollars in talent and workforce development services. So WIOA is very important and the city is making other investments in other areas. So WIOA ends up being a little less than 10% of the overall budget. Um, and that's in the context of a, a city budget, a citywide budget of about 112 billion. So workforce is now about 1% of the city's budget. And that's, in, I think, probably about the highest it's been uh, for the city. Okay, so WIOA is actually one in a series of federal workforce programs that started back in the 1930s under President Roosevelt and the Works Progress Administration. And ever since then, there have been different programs all the way into the 1998. Some of you may be familiar with the Workforce Investment Act, WIA. Um, and then WIOA was voted in in 2014, and it was enacted in 2015, which is why um, this slide shows that WIOA is, has been active from 2015 to the present. And let me say, from the transition from WIA to WIOA, what a difference in O makes. Uh, I say that facetiously, uh, but that, that is the one difference in the acronym. There are some substantive differences between the two, and that's why it was renamed. Okay. So a brief overview of WIOA programs. When you think about WIOA programs, there are sort of two basic categories that we work in. We have services for adults and we have services for youth. Um, within the context of adults, we define, WIOA defines adults as 18 years of age or older. WIOA also defines a group of adults, a subset of adults called dislocated workers. And these are workers who have either already been laid off or they've been notified of an imminent layoff. And so they're sort of a special group of adults, but all the same services are available to adults or dislocated workers. So that's adults. Then with, within the context of youth, 
we always distinguishes between two different types of youth and youth services. So there are in-school youth and there are out-of-school youth. In-school youth are aged 14 to 21. They are low income and then they have an additional barrier to employment. Out-of-school youth, by contrast, have a slightly different age range, 16 to 24, also low income, one additional barrier to employment. And these are young people who are not in school and not working, uh, sometimes called opportunity youth or disconnected youth. Now, you can tell from this chart that there is some overlap, right? 18 to 24 uh, is a spot where individuals could go to either program. And in fact, WIOA encourages co-enrollment, and we do have a number of individuals who enroll in both the youth and the adult programs. So to get concrete about the funding that we have, um, these are the different funding categories of money that we receive um, from New York State Department of Labor, which in turn gets funding from the U.S. Department of Labor. So we have funding for adult dislocated worker, and youth. And again, adult and dislocated worker, those are both adult-focused categories, right? So for adults, we have about $65 million to spend this year. Um, and for youth, we have about $34 million. So that's a total of a little over $99 million that we have locally that we can spend on WIOA services for these folks. So this chart, this shows our annual um, WIOA levels from the beginning of WIOA 2014 to present. Um, what's notable, so the blue is basically, that's our total WIOA budget. The red reflects the money that we have for adults and dislocated workers, right? So that's our adult money. And the green line is the funding that we have to serve youth. And you can see that from 2014 to 2021, we sort of hovered around the $60 million mark, a little bit up, a little bit, a little bit above, a little bit below. And then the last few years, we saw this, this pretty giant leap up to about $100 million. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but essentially WIOA is formula funded. It's based on economic factors. And New York City, as as you all well know, right after the pandemic, we lost almost a million jobs locally, a lot of people out of work. And that's one of the key factors that goes into this formula. And so New York State got a lot more money than it typically does. And New York City got even more money than it typically does. Um, and you can see that there's a little bit of a lag too, right? We didn't get the money right away. It sort of came, uh, you know, a year or two after the the worst part of the pandemic. So we are at pretty historically high levels. We haven't seen $100 million in our budget um, since I think 2004. So it's been about 20 years since we've seen this level of funding. Um, so we are using it wisely these days. Um, okay. In terms of we've got this funding, right? And what can we use the funding for? There are certain services that are required that we must provide. And then there are services that we may provide and we have options around that. But I'm going to talk briefly about what do we, what are we required to provide at a minimum? So for adults, again, for the adults and the dislocated workers, um, there are sort of two mechanisms through which we provide services. We have one-stop career centers, what we call Workforce One career centers in New York City, right? And the idea there is that it's a one-stop center. It's it, in one stop, you can get access to all the services you need, or you can get a referral to other types of services if they're not available on site. And then there's training, and there's a variety of ways in which we offer training to New Yorkers, which I'll describe in a moment. So. These are the two mechanisms, and through these two mechanisms, we offer three categories of services. These are, these are required under WIOA. So there are basic career services, there are individualized career services, and then there are training services. So basic career services, these are things that anybody can access. You don't even technically have to prove that you are work authorized in the United States. Um, WIOA, makes, WIOA makes a lot of fuss about, like, these services should be universally accessible to anybody who's 18 or older. 
they don't typically require a lot of intensive staff assistance. And this is things like giving somebody access to a computer lab so they can look for a job or giving them access to labor market information. What are the jobs that are in demand in the local area? What are some of the opportunities that we might have available through the Workforce One system? Individualized career services, by contrast, these are available to customers as appropriate. So not everybody has access to these. Um, they typically require more intensive staff assistance, and this includes things like providing somebody one-on-one -on -one career advising, job matching, in other words, helping connect somebody to open job opportunities, making a referral to an employer interview. So these are very individualized and require more, more staff time. The third category, training services, is really about connecting New Yorkers that um, meet eligibility requirements and who we deem would benefit from training to a couple different types of training. The two primary ones that we use are a voucher system. They're called individual training account vouchers. Under the law, we call them individual training grants. So we, we tweak the word slightly, but the idea is that these are not for everybody. We, we want to see people who we think would benefit from training, but for this course that they are interested in taking. Um, and so they can take a voucher and use it at any, um, any training provider that's on this state managed list, the eligible training provider list, and they can get access to training. And we're not going to go into detail about this today, but we do limit the number of occupations that these are available for uh, because we want to make sure that they're aligned with where employer demand is. The second major type of, co of training service that we offer is what we call cohort training. So we will work with a training provider. Often it is a CUNY college. Sometimes we competitively bid out to nonprofits or for-profits, and we essentially buy a classroom. We, we pay for a group of people to go through training together with the goal in mind of mastering the set of skills around an occupation. And then further that once they are done, we have an expectation that a high percentage of them will get a, a relevant job after that training. So these are the basic categories of services that are required under WIOA. Okay, so that's for you. that was for adults. Now I'm gonna talk about what's required for youth. So youth are a little different. Youth have to have access to 14 different program elements. Um, it's not that every young person has to get all 14 services, but those 14 services need to at least be available to every young person we serve, whether they're in the out-of-school youth program or the in-school youth program. I've grouped these into different categories. Uh, they include work preparation, educational support, personal supports, and enrichment services. So I'm not going to read all of them, but I'll highlight a few. So work preparation, we provide paid and unpaid, we must provide paid and unpaid work experiences to youth enrolled under WIOA. Um, we must provide occupational skill training, integrated education and training, and some information about um, what are trends in the labor market and what are some of the available jobs. Um, other things to highlight, we offer GED preparation for individuals, for youth that do not have a high school diploma or more. Uh, in terms of personal supports, we offer comprehensive guidance and counseling. And in terms of enrichment, we offer leadership development and mentoring. So again, these are 14 required services that we have to make available. Not every youth has to take advantage of them, but we have to make them available. This is the model under WIOA. So youth is a lot more of an intensive model, an intensive services model compared to the adult model. Okay. One final note about the youth funding. Some of you are very familiar with this because we've talked about it in past board meetings if you're a returning member. There's a couple of requirements under the law in terms of how we spend our youth money. Number one, we have to spend at least 75% of our youth funds on out-of-school youth as opposed to in-school youth. The law prioritizes young people who are not working and not in school. Um, and then secondly, the law requires that we spend at least 20% of our youth funds on work experience. And this primarily is driven by the wages that we offer for internships, uh, but it also includes some of the staff time required to, 
or the contractor time, which we'll get into, but uh, the, the time required to work with employers to find internships and to support the young people into and through those internships. So these are required elements or these are required percentages uh, that govern how we spend our youth dollars. Okay, moving on, we talked about adults, what services are required for adults, what services we have to provide to young people. Now we're gonna talk about services available to employers. With employers, it's a lot less prescriptive. So basically, there's only a couple of things that we're technically required to provide to employers, some labor market information, and what we owe calls labor exchange services. Essentially, we need to help match talent to what employers are looking for in terms of filling their open job opportunities. And that can be simply through a website where we're matching them, or it can be through a more active uh, process of recruiting, screening, and referring candidates. And that is really what um, what we do at Scale in New York City. But the basic requirement is to offer some kind of labor exchange. So that's what's required. The available services that we have um, are more than that. And there are a lot of opportunities to, to offer more than what's minimally required. And we, we offer a lot more than what is minimally required. So through the youth programs, we offer several employer-facing services. We help them recruit interns and we match interns to employers. We also help recruit and match full-time hires from the young people that are in those programs. And we also provide skill training aligned with um, in-demand occupations and sectors of the economy uh, to really prepare those young people for occupations that employers are hiring for. On the adult side, um, as I mentioned before, uh, recruitment is a major service and, and the Department of Small Business Services will talk about this in a little bit, but essentially we source, screen and match qualified job seekers often to fill 10 or more openings for an individual employer. So we do a lot of recruitment at scale. We do lots of recruitment events. We connect a lot of people to jobs. But in addition to that, we also offer employers training. We offer different kinds of training. Uh, two key ones are, two key types are customized training, which is a program through which employers can apply for funding to develop a training program that is customized to meet their individual needs. We also offer cohort training that I mentioned earlier. And the way that that works is that we have these industry partnership teams that are part of NYC Talent. These are small teams of sector experts. And they essentially assess what are the major talent challenges that employers in a given sector are facing. And they engage employers in designing curricula to meet their needs. And then finally, they work with a training provider to offer cohort training that produces qualified individuals that meet the needs of local employers. So these are some of the available services that we offer to employers. Okay. So let's talk about how this money gets to us. How do we end up providing these services? Where does the money come from? What's the sort of stream of where that money comes from? Um, and what are the accountability mechanisms? So every year, the U.S. Congress passes an appropriations bill and the president signs it. And that's where the money comes from. And you, I sort of think of it as this big pie and the pie gets divided up to different states. And so we want, obviously, the bigger the, the starting size of the pie, the better off we are. Um, and so this year, the total pie for WIO is about $3 billion nationally, okay? And so you, the U.S. Congress has approved that. The president signed off on it. Then the U.S. Department of Labor applies a formula. I mentioned before that there's a formula that determines how much each state gets of the three buckets of funding, adult, dislocated worker, and youth. And it's not subject to politics. It really is based on economic factors that change a little bit each year. And accordingly, it divides up the, the state allocations every year. And so this year, the New York State Department of Labor, which receives the WIOA funds on behalf of New York State, they, got, they get $250 million. They keep some of that. That's within WIOA. That's a part of WIOA that the state can keep a certain percentage of those funds for its purposes. And then 
they apply, the state applies a similar formula that the feds do to divide the money up across a bunch of local areas. Talk about those in one second, but New York City, unsurprisingly, is the largest local area in terms of population in New York State. Um, we get the, the largest WIOA allocation, both in the state and in the country. Um, again, our budget is about $99 million this year. Uh, so that comes down to the New York City Office of Management and Budget. They receive WIO on behalf of the city. And then we, Abby mentioned that we work very closely with two strong agency partners, the Department of Small Business Services and the Department of Youth and Community Development. Department of Small Business Services, SBS for short, they receive the adult and dislocated worker money, which was about $65 million combined, right? Adult and dislocated worker in this current fiscal year. And then the Department of Youth and Community Development receives about $34 million. And then again, there is this accountability chain. So the board, which we'll talk about a little bit later, the board is responsible for making sure that we're spending our money well, that we're spending it on time, that we're meeting our performance outcomes. Um, and the New York State Department of Labor is also responsible for making sure that all of the local areas around the state are meeting their, are doing the same thing, that they are spending their money wisely, they're meeting their performance outcomes, they are compliant with WIOA. And then they, in turn, as a state, are uh, accountable to the U.S. Department of Labor, which has ultimate um, responsibility for making sure that every state is implementing WIOA appropriately. So this is the funding flow, and it also reflects the sort of the chain of accountability that happens under WIOA. Okay, so administration of WIOA programs. We've, Abby and I have mentioned this in different ways, but it's, we just want to really highlight the, the important role that our agency experts play in the administration of WIOA. So we've got DYCD and SBS, two agencies that have managed uh, WIOA or WIA funding for uh, the, at least two decades. Very, Both agencies are very expert in administering this funding and how it works. Um, and one very noteworthy thing that some people on this call probably know well is that the city in the city of New York typically city workers don't provide direct human services. More typically, we bid out contracts for services. And that's what we do for WIOA. So DYCD and SBS, although they do administer and manage these programs, they select providers that are responsible for delivering services to New Yorkers and to employers. So the roles that they play that SBS and DYCD play, they are acting on behalf of the board to a large extent through competitively procuring contracts, through managing contracts, through monitoring providers to make sure they're compliant and hitting their goals and spending their money, and to generally managing these federal WIOA dollars that are coming into the city of New York. Okay. I want to emphasize for a minute, the procurement process. The procurement process is how the city is required to purchase goods and services. Um, and I mention this because there is a role for the board in selecting providers. Um, but it's important to note that WIOA recognizes that there are procurement rules in municipalities and states, and that local areas like New York City have to follow them. So accordingly, the agencies, SBS and DYCD, they are responsible for developing and releasing a, a competitive request for proposals, or RFP for short. There are different formats, but RFPs are the most common. And what happens is agencies, they, they present a summary of the services that they need and their expectations for a potential contractor. And then proposers respond. They provide a description of their relevant experience, their organizational capacity, and their proposed approach to, to meeting the requested needs in the request for proposals, then the city agencies appoint a review committee to evaluate the proposals. Um, and finally, there are oversight entities within the city that have to review and approve these RFPs. I think typically for those that are $100,000 or more, that includes the law department, the mayor's office of contract services, and the comptroller's office. So we say all this just to give you the context that 
procurement isn't having happening in a vacuum. There are a lot of rules around how it needs to happen. There are laws governing this process. And we really rely heavily on small business services and the Department of Youth and Community Development to procure the, the WIOA contracts to deliver the services uh, that we provide to, to New Yorkers and to New York City-based employers. Okay. Um, this is the last slide that I'll present in this section and then we'll pause for some questions and answers. Um, so performance measures. So in line with the theme of accountability, WIOA requires that we track and report on certain types of performance and they fall into four different categories. Training, employment, earnings, and employer satisfaction. So within training, we have to show that individuals that are involved in training are making skill gains. We all want to make sure that if somebody's in a training program, they're actually learning something. They're not just sitting there doing nothing. The next training measure is credential rate. So we owe a very much emphasizes the need to earn industry recognized credentials, right? Something that's a tangible outcome from training that is recognizable, that is transferable, that is portable uh, from one uh, region to another that employers recognize. So a certain number of people who go through training need to earn that kind of credential. When it comes to the employment measures, there are two. Uh, they're a little bit complicated and wonky, but generally speaking, they are looking at what percentage of people who leave WIOA services, who are no longer participating in career services or training services, what percent are employed essentially after six months, and what percent are employed 12 months after leaving services. So it's really more of a retention measure to see what percentage of the folks that are getting these services are actually connecting to employment six months and 12 months down the road after. Another area, another performance measure is earnings. So we always also concerned about job quality. And there is a measure that we have to meet around a certain median level of earnings um, essentially for six months after somebody has finished their WIO, their regular WIOA services. And then finally, employer satisfaction. Um, for employer satisfaction, there are two measures of employer effectiveness, or rather our effectiveness in serving employers. One is penetration rate. So what percentage of local employers do we work with? And then retention. So what percentage of employers that we serve come back for another service, right? So good measure of whether somebody was satisfied if, is if they come back and request additional services. So those are the six performance measures that are required under WIOA. All right, that was a lot, uh, but trying to live up to the, the deep dive in the title and give folks a, a real sense of how WIOA works and the funding and the performance measures and accountability. So let me pause and see if there are any questions at this point, and I'm going to try to stop sharing my screen. And please use the hand raise. So Henry, well done. Or alternatively, you can put a question in chat and we can read that out loud if you're having trouble with your audio. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Chris, thank you for that very thorough presentation. It's good to refresh on the rules. I have a question in relationship to coordination between federal programs that has been a issue in the past. We represent some more welfare to work recipients, so we're part of the, you know, the whole work work requirement that are called JPPs. Work mostly in parks, sanitation. There are about three thousand of them. Um, they're always in job jeopardy because at the end of the six months, they basically get laid off, and then they have to reapply. And we always trying to get training to put them into work. But the the the, the question I have is. Could someone who is already on the federal program, uh, like this program, the job training participants, apply for an under the WIA board, the regular rules, the same funding mechanism that you have under the WIA? Are there any like barriers for that? Uh, thanks for that question, Henry. So I assume you're you're referring to like the Parks Opportunity Program participants and some of the folks that. As you said, the sanitation department um, hires. 
uh, as job training participants? So the short answer is yes. Like the WIO is very explicit about trying to integrate with other federal sources of funding. Um, TANF is a required partner in the WIOA system. And in fact, there are, uh, you know, the Department of, uh, or rather the Human Resources Administration makes a ton of referrals of some of their candidates to the Workforce One Career Centers. Uh, so WIOA very much envisions that as much as possible, TANF and WIOA should try to integrate where it makes sense. And so absolutely, these uh, these individuals that are job training participants at the Parks Department and Sanitation um, can enroll, can co-enroll in WIOA or can enroll in WIOA after they're done with their programs. But we can absolutely serve them and we should we should talk more about what we could do. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I see Tim Johnson has his hand up. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. Terrific presentation. Um, I wanted to ask... How and sorry if you said this and I missed it, how do the workforce career centers identify the job opportunities? I get how they get the candidates in, but the job opportunities, what's what's the mechanism for um, accessing those? So I will defer to my colleagues at SBS if they want to give a brief answer, but I know they are going to talk a bit more about this shortly when they give a presentation, but Yuri or Janine, do you want to just briefly speak to how you find these job opportunities with employers? Yes, I can do that. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, yeah, in terms of being able to find or identify the employers themselves, we're very much a demand-driven system. Um, so we do have a team of account managers in each of the centers that are actively looking to engage businesses really throughout the th really throughout their time, right? Um, so it's doing cold calling to look for different opportunities. It's relationship building. So many of the employers that we're, we're, we we're working with, we've worked with over a long period of time. So it's a consistent need in terms of fulfilling on their volume needs. Um, they will go out to really kind of view um, and and kind of hit the pavement to see or identify any additional job opportunities that we might be able to fill. And then also too, um, the reason that we're we are in a small the Department of Small Business Services is because we are in fact one of the solutions that we provide to to businesses. So at any point in time, at any different touch points that the different divisions are working alongside businesses, one of the things they talk about is our services in terms of recruitment themselves. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more um, as we present um, on our um, division. Janine, thank you. Why don't you introduce yourself so everyone yeah. knows who you are. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Janine jones -a. I am the Assistant Commissioner of Workforce One, and I have been with SBS for about 13 years now. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Janine. Um, I see that we do have a couple of questions in the chat, so I will, I will read those. Um, Joe Kenner asks, what standard do we use for a living wage for a single person, a couple, families, et cetera? So just to be clear, WIOA doesn't have any requirements around living wage. Um, certainly, we strive to connect job seekers to as high, uh, high paying a job as we possibly can find, and SBS and DYCD do a great job. Uh, focusing on job quality. It's not inherent in WIOA. Um, Abby, I don't know if you want to say anything about it. I think you mentioned living wage in some of your, excuse me, opening remarks. Yeah. So what, I mean, we don't have an official city standard of living wage. Um, what we have used in, for instance, the Green Economy Action Plan is the MIT living wage calculator. Um, and in that one for focus occupations at the time, it was about 30 $31 an hour. Um, what we do, though, is really is trying to focus, and this is an issue for all of us as we think about the um, talent and workforce development, is, is really understanding, is a job living wage day one? Is it a springboard job to a living wage? So there's a clear pathway there. Or is it more of a static or, um, or um, sand, sand trap job? So, so really trying to get as many into either springboard or living wage. Um, but I think it is one of the, the issues that we as a city um, wrestle with and continue to wrestle with, particularly given how much the, um, the cost of living in New York has gone up um, and the fact that there 
seems to be somewhat of a hollowing out of the middle skill job. So it's going to be something that we're going to constantly wrestle with as a, as a system um, that, and, and really need to, you know, have all of your brains um, come together to really think about how do we address. Um, it's also one of the reasons that we have been looking to the city as an employer too, because we know that there are some, some pathway jobs there that do create economic mobility, but we really need to, to, to continue to, to, examine and, and and look at what strategies we can do to make sure we get as many people into a living wage job. And also one of the reasons why we need to focus on affordable housing. Great. There are two more questions in the chat and maybe we'll take those and then move on to the, the agency presentations. We have one from Saudia Davis and one from John Calbelli. So Saudia asks, could you please clarify how employment data is monitored? Additionally, is the focus on individuals who found employment via WIOA direct placement services, or does it also encompass individuals who have utilized any related services at some stage? Um, I will take a shot at answering this, and then uh, I welcome uh, SBS or TYCT to uh, clarify anything that I may have missaid. So there are a couple ways, and I can speak specifically to, to what SBS does. Um, which is really operating at, at scale, um, serving, I think, about 90,000 people a year and connecting upwards of, of 20 to 25,000 to jobs. So with in terms of the employment data under WIOA, the New York State Department of Labor looks at wage record system data. That is the data that employers are required to submit, I think, on a quarterly basis up to the state. Um, and it monitors uh, you know, earnings and who's working. And so that is sort of the, the official data system of record for WIOA in terms of who's getting jobs and how much are they making. Um, we also locally, we look at, I mean, SBS in particular also tracks its own measures and tracks what happens to the customers that they are seeing, what how many of them get jobs, and with which employers. Um, and then I think the final piece of your question, Saudia, is like, do we count individuals or do we focus on individuals that we are directly connecting to, to jobs or does it also encompass people who have you know, received other services and maybe found their way to a job? So we count it all. We only count, we only pay our contractors. I mentioned that we have providers and contractors. We only pay our contractors for people that they directly connect to an employer after they've screened and referred them and they or another center has developed a relationship with that employer. But if individuals get meaningful services through our system and then they go on to find employment, we do also count those, um, but they don't count towards the, the contractor's goals. Uh, Janine, keep me honest. Did I do okay? It was perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and I see Henry's got his hand up. Let me let me do John Calvelli's uh, question, which he posted in the chat, and then we'll go to Henry. And then I think let's Henry will be the last question for this section, and we will have more time for Q and A as we go. Um, John asks, "What are the penalties for not reaching those metrics? Will the federal government claw back funding?" That's a great question. Um, under WIOA, local areas don't really face uh, financial penalties. Under WIA, we did. Under WIA, we do not. Um, we do monitor that carefully. We don't like to fail any of the measures. Generally speaking, we meet our measures. Um, WIA, it does have a clause where if you if you do not hit your performance target for three years in a row, then um, the governor is supposed to reorganize the workforce development. Um, but we have never come close to that. And we would certainly alert you all and um, I don't anticipate that that is a reality. So there aren't harsh penalties, but we do have to submit a performance improvement plan to the New York State Department of Labor. As I mentioned before, they we are accountable to them to meeting our measures. And uh, we work, you know, I, I work very closely as staff to the board. I work very closely with SBS and DYCD for not meeting those measures to take appropriate actions to make sure either we're delivering services in a different way or we're capturing data differently in order to meet those measures. Okay, um, Henry, last question for the section, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, when you talk about employment or leading to employment, what happens with temp agencies? So if 
is that considered full employment for the purpose of this discussion and the payment? So temp agencies, my understanding is they do count. That is a job. I do not think we, that we rely very heavily on them. Janine, you're shaking your head. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, so the majority of the opportunities that are in the center are not through temp agencies. There are very, very rare exceptions. For example, if that is the only pathway to connection within a specific industry, like I think that there's one or two allowances within our system itself, but the majority of our opportunities are with um, um, full-time employers. Um, and yeah. also, like, there's... Um, so it's not temporary, but there might be, for example, contractors contracting businesses. So, for example, like an allied or securitas where they that we're working primarily with them and then they contract work out. So those are like the yeah, only. No, no, I, I was talking about a specific. So there's an agency called Good Temps, which is a subset of many of the city agencies. And so there's a referral to them and then they refer people to work in city jobs, but they back because this temp. And so they meet like three months requirement for payment and then they go back. And this recidivism is always like crazy. And I, I think, you know, this has been an issue before. There ought to be something that flags this kind of behavior where a, a center refers to a temp agency, meets the threshold just enough and comes back. So love to talk to you offline, Janine, about this. Thank you. Sure. And Henry, I'll just say, too, that that we, um, through through the Center for Workplace Accessibility and Inclusion, which is not, it's part of New York City Talent. I'm very involved with it. We we definitely work with Goodwill and Good Temps and would love to talk um, further about that. I'd love to be a part of that conversation. Okay, great. These are great questions. Uh, wish we could have uh, additional time right now. We will save time later for more questions and answers. Um, but I do want to now shift. We have a couple of presentations from our agency partners, some of whom have already introduced themselves. Um, so we are going to, I'm going to turn it over to the New York City Department of Small Business Services, and they are SBS for short, and they are going to talk about how they serve adults and dislocated workers in New York City under WIOA. So let me pull up your deck. Give me one second. All right. So hi again, everyone. Again, my name is Janine Jonesa, and I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Workforce One. Um, as Chris has mentioned, um, there's, there's, I know that you're getting a lot of information today. So, so please feel free at any point in time, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out. And then next slide. So again, um, in terms of Workforce One, we'll get a little bit more into the very specifics of it, but this is just a broad overview in terms of our programs and the services that we deliver. Um, so we serve adults 18 years or up. Um, in terms of eligibility, they just have to be New York City residents and at least 18 years of age. Um, in terms of the services that we offer, and we'll, again, we'll go a little bit more into detail, but in the individuals, um, about 29,000 individuals are getting access to what we call either job readiness or career development services. So as you can imagine, as we're seeing a number of individuals, about 90,000 per year, there's a number of folks that are ready to connect to jobs immediately, but a lot of them aren't, right? Um, a lot of them need some additional supports that would be inclusive of meeting with a career advisor to get one-on-one -on -one supports. Um, we provide workshops with any job seekers that need them. So for example, if someone needs assistance in terms of developing their resume um, or, you know, really making making their resume more marketable, or they might need assistance in terms of um, interview skills. Uh, we also offer financial empowerment courses. So any um, skill or service that we think would be necessary for an individual to connect to job opportunities, they're able to access them with within our center. Um, we also provide recruitment services, obviously, and that's where you get to meet with an account manager. Um, and that's where we're really, again, I mentioned before that we're very much a demand-driven system, meaning that we're working with our employers and our commitment to them is always to find the most qualified talent for them. So we do wanna make sure that we truly understand what their needs are, what they're looking for in terms of skill sets and requirements. And then we take all of that intel to identify the right um, candidate or the next match for that um, positioner 
um, and experience. What I'll also say, we also use that in Intel for ourselves, right? If we notice any trends, if we um, understand some of the skill sets that our employers are looking for, we utilize all of that information in terms of developing our services too. So it really serves uh, twofold. Um, we also refer um, candidates to um, supportive services. So that would be any services that we do not offer in-house, but we know it's necessary in terms of a job seeker success, in terms of seeking employment. We do um, have a network of what we call community partners. So it's about 360 uh, partners all across New York City, because again, um, New York City doesn't always necessarily lack for the amount of resources. It's the, the challenge is really being able to navigate those resources. So to get to the right person at the right time. Um, so we work with those partners uh, through our community partner program. We better understand what the services are that they provide. And then we make a warm referral off to those organizations. And by that, I mean, it's not just a hi, hello. I know that there's an organization that does this. We really do have relationships with these organizations. We understand what their eligibility, some of their basic eligibility criteria is, when they might be offering cohorts or when the best um, time to access their services is, and most importantly, who the best point of contact is. So again, we can share that information with the job seeker to ensure that they're getting um, all of the resources that they need in terms of having a successful job search. And then finally, we have about 7,000 individuals that we're able to connect to occupational trainings. So in terms of our system overall, we have 18 Workforce One centers really all across New York City. And as Chris mentioned, uh, we do do that day-to-day -day work through providers. We have about three main providers throughout our system. One thing to note though, is even though there's separate providers and 18 different locations, it truly does act as one single system. Um, uh, Chris had mentioned a little bit in terms of our database, all of that information regarding each of the individuals are, is in a centralized database, which really allows us, to, um, any job seeker can access services no matter where they go. We understand what services they have availed themselves to. We know that where they are in their job search. And most importantly, we're able to track um, both referrals and connection to employment opportunities overall. Um, within our 18 Workforce One centers, we have what we call five hub. Um, or one-stop shops. Um, and those are really our larger centers. Right? And that's where we're gonna see the majority of our traffic. Within those centers, it's probably staffed anywhere between 30 to 45 staff members in each of the centers. And it really does host the majority of our services. We do also have what we call satellite centers. So those are more, um, they're smaller centers and they have a staff about three to five, but the unique aspect of those centers of, those centers themselves, they really do serve a specific purpose in terms of serving either specific communities or specific um, pockets of populations. For example, we have a center that's located in West Farms that has customized services specifically um, designed for out of school, out of work youth. Or Washington Heights, we have services that are specifically designed and geared towards um, foreign born New Yorkers. Likewise, we have um, centers that really focus on justice involved. Please note that it doesn't mean that that we're not seeing or serving these individuals really throughout our system. It just means that these centers are very specific and have very specific services that we can um, offer for individuals that are really finding it um, as a true challenge or a barrier in terms of seeking employment. And they often um, times um, we leverage the, re the rest of the system will leverage their unique skill sets and expertise and services really throughout our centers itself. And we also have some satellite centers are just serving specific communities. For example, we have a center that's located in the Rockaways. And because of its geographic location, isolation and location, we've decided to open up a center knowing that a lot of individuals really want to work within the community. It's very unique in terms of the business development itself. So we have a center that's located there as well. Um, and then finally, we have what we call sector centers. Um, and it's exactly what I guess the name implies. They really focus in on um, specific sectors. Um, so we have one system that's really focused in on, it's called the industrial and transportation centers. Um, and those are really focused in on um, industrial, transportation, um, construction, manufacturing. And it really does give job seekers kind of an in-depth understanding within those industries themselves. And then we have um, a healthcare system, which is actually actually located um, here in downtown Manhattan where um, candidates can access um, opportunities that are very specific to clinical roles or opportunities.
Um, we see about, as I mentioned before, about 90,000 individuals that come through our centers and we connect about 22,000 individuals to job opportunities per year. And on here, um, you can view this at your own leisure. I just put all of the locations um, really across the system. And then in terms of our demographics, so as I mentioned, we have a, a pretty, um, we, we're able to collect a lot of data and it really gives us access to really um, analyze the data that we're seeing. We have a better understanding of who, who's utilize, utilizing our services, what services, are there any gaps, um, what demographics, who, what, who might we be missing? But this is just a brief summary of some of our more basic um, demographic information. So about 23% of our customers are age um, 25 years or under. Um, the majority of individuals that we serve are between the ages of 25 to 49. 87% um, of the job seekers that we see have achieved at least their high school diploma. 55% um, of the individuals that we work with identify themselves as males males or men, 41% um, females or women, and then 4% there was no response. 75% um, oh, of the individuals or customers that we work with identify themselves as being Black, African American, Hispanic, or Latino. Um, and then again, this just gives you a quick um, breakdown in terms of the traffic that we're seeing. So about 90,000, as I mentioned, and meaningful services. So we really do designate. So someone can't just walk in and out of our center and we consider them as served. We really do try to identify the services that we consider being um, necessary in terms of someone being able to connect to employment. Um, we also have the number of uh, individuals enrolled into training, which is 7,069. Um, and in, ter in terms of total hires, as of now, or as of today, um, we are um, we have validated sixteen thousand um, one hundred and sixty one hires. Um, but what I will note is our validation process. There's a little bit of a lag, um, just because in terms of our employment, we don't actually capture hires until we get validation from the employer that that individual has in fact started working. And we have an understanding in terms of what their hours are um, and the the salary range rate wage that they will get as well. And that's when we validate. So it takes probably um, from connection to um, actual our actual validation process, it could take anywhere between like a month or three months for us to really connect. Um, but we anticipate um, closing out the year at about 22,000 hires. Um, and then in terms of serving employers, we talked about a little bit th about this before. Again, first and foremost, we're very much an employer-driven system, meaning that our, our real bread and butter is to really make sure that we have relationships with our employers, that we can, can, can connect people to employment. Um, and that really kind of, as I mentioned, that really determines the services that we offer within our centers, what those skill sets they are, um, what, that, what that employers are looking at, um, and allows us really to be successful in terms of the connection. So we work with about 900 121 employers all um, throughout New York City. Uh, throughout the year, as of now, we've developed about 32,000 different job opportunities. And then also working with businesses, um, we've awarded um, training grants to them as, as well, um, specifically to specific employers for about 12. All right. And then with that, I will be turning it over to Justin. Hi all, uh, my name is Justin Gale. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Budgets and Reporting for uh, Department of Small Business Services, Workforce Development Division. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit ab about uh, our uh, performance against the WIOA measures that Chris had uh, mentioned in his initial um, uh, overview of WIOA. Um, as Chris mentioned, we are, uh, you know, we, we receive funding and oversight by the State Department of Labor. Um, so we have, uh, they're the ones who who take our data, uh, receive it, and and uh, evaluate us against these measures. Um, uh, what this table here shows our performance through quarter three, um, which is the latest uh, period for which we have data. Um, there are uh, five measures that apply to us to our programs, and um, they apply to both the, both of our populations, the adults and dislocated workers. Um, as you can see in, the, see in the table, the first column will show uh, what we've achieved. The second column, the goal, is the 
uh, or the columns to the right, I mean, um, the goal is the goal that we're measured against. And then the third one is the percent of goal that we, of our, as far as our achievement. Um, this shows that we have, for the dislocated worker, we've uh, surpassed our goal in five of the five measures. And for adults, um, we've done so in four of the five measures. Um, the measures themselves, employment rate, uh, quarter two, that's the first one at the top. That means uh, people after receiving services, they finish receiving services. There's they, um, it's a percentage of customers who are employed two quarters after um, they exit our system. Um, and then median, median earnings for that same population um, is another goal. Um, third goal is employment rate four quarters after uh, leaving the system. So uh, it, the measures sort of look at how is someone doing six months after they finish receiving services and are they still employed a year after receiving services? Um, and then the last two, credential attainment and measurable, measurable skills gain apply to people who have received trainings and are going through educational programs. Um, and they want to look to see, you know, has someone actually uh, leveled up as far as skill development and um, what sort of credentials have they received from uh, the, the services we've delivered. Um, the one measure where we have not uh, met the goal, credential attainment for adult, it's at 74%. Um, as of quarter three, we worked quite hard with our partners at the state um, to uh, make sure that we're going to pass that measure uh, when the quarter fourth quarter um, end of year numbers come out, and we're um, we're quite sure that we will have uh, passed that measure. Um, and furthermore, made we made significant changes to our system, how we track some of the data and how it's mapped and sent to the state um, to make sure that it, that it we should be meeting that on in, um, going forward as well. Um, so that is that is our wheel performance uh, for FY twenty four. Um, I will now pass uh, it on to uh, my colleague, Ishmael Mohammed. Uh, 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 hi, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ishmael Mohammed. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Budget for SPS. So today I'm going to be presenting the budget for SPS. Uh, as you can see on the slide, the total budget for, uh, for SPS is around $70.4 million. And uh, 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 we have also allocated $32.2 million for workforce career centers uh, to fund the operations of 18 career centers, which represent about 46% of our total budget. Uh, also, we have budgeted uh, $16.3 million for training to train job seekers in New York City and on various uh, and in-demand fields. Uh, the training budget is about 23% of the total budget again. And also we allocated 3.4 million uh, for business solution centers uh, to fund the operations uh, of the centers in New York City to help uh, small businesses. Uh, so now uh, uh, the, the budget for uh, personal services, SBS budgeted 15 million uh, for personal services uh, to cover the salaries of the workforce uh, development division uh, that uh, handles uh, the main uh, part of uh, uh, the workforce, and also uh, the division of the business solution, solution centers, technology, administration, New York City talent, and the workforce investment board. So all those staff are charged again as uh, the 15 million budget that we have allocated. Uh, 5.6 million of the PS budget uh, is allocated for fringe. Uh, the fringe rate for New York City is around uh, 58%, and the rest of 9.4 million is allocated uh, to his staff. Uh, the estimated FTEs uh, of our budget is around 100 FTEs. Uh, so due to OMB freeze, uh, the personal services is spending uh, is estimated to be less than 15 in FY24 because uh, of the freeze, we were unable to hire a lot of people. So, um, and uh, spending will come up a little bit less than 15. So right now we're still closing FY24. Uh, so um, probably in the next meeting, we will have accurate numbers of how much was charged to FY24. Uh, also other than personal services, we have allocated and 3.4, uh, 3.5 million rather, 
and 3 million of the OTBS uh, was earmarked to develop new fiscal system uh, aimed at ordinating and enhancing the efficiency of the fiscal workflow of uh, and the processes uh, in the budget unit. Most of these funds are not spent in FY24. Uh, the preliminary work has already started and, and we have hired a consultant uh, to facilitate the work uh, to, uh, to develop the, that new system. Uh, we are planning to complete uh, this project in FY25. Uh, the remaining 500 uh, was uh, budgeted to cover the regular uh, administrative uh, expenses. Uh, I, and I think that's uh, all I have for uh, for the budget presentation. So anyone, if you guys have any questions, I can uh, answer your questions. Great. Um, Ishmael, thank you so much. Um, good morning, uh, board members. My name is Yuri Pawlik. I'm uh, the Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development at SBS. Um, I want to extend a warm welcome to all the new board members. Um, also want to specially recognize Michelle Clark, who's our Assistant Commissioner for our amazing training team that oversees um, customized training and our sector-based and cohort training as well, joining us on the call. Um, wanted to just spend a minute or two talking with you about um, some of our fiscal 25 activities, uh, some of the things that we have in store for this year. Um, one of our um, you know, major activities, uh, one of our major points of focus is re-RFPing um, the entire Workforce One system, all 18 career centers. Um, it's been many, many years um, since um, we last RFP'd them, since we last issued uh, proposals to new vendors. Um, as Chris described earlier in the call, um, these 18 centers are run under contract um, with provider partners. Um, those contracts are competitively bid. Um, we need to rebid them from time to time, especially since workforce needs and trends are changing. Um, and we just did that this year. Um, so um, this past summer, proposals were due about a month ago, um, maybe about five weeks ago now, actually. Um, we made sure to um, you know, enhance the parameters around what we were looking for. Um, so that uh, to, for changing workforce needs, um, a big emphasis on community engagement, a big emphasis on technology and the changing nature of you know, work, um, and an emphasis on making sure that the needs of diverse populations were met. Um, you know, some of the populations that we specially focus on that our priorities are veterans, which were alluded on the slides, um, recent immigrants in, in New Yorkers. Um, we presented um, on that to the board previously. Um, and, you know, um, people with, with, with like disabilities as well. Um, and I know that my colleague Assistant Commissioner Joan Sa had an opportunity to present to you um, and get input um, on the RFP process on our request for, 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 for you know, proposals sometime back. Um, so we're now at the point um, where we have received bids. Uh, we're forming panels in order to review those proposals that have come in. Um, and we're going to do our very best, um, you know, uh, you know, with a target towards, I would say, early in calendar year 2025, um, or a little bit later after that to have those contracts up and running. Um, and we're very excited about the promise that they have. Um, and, you know, as soon as those contracts are out and approved and implemented, I can tell you, it's uh, kind of like running for office. Um, we're already going to be looking towards 2028 because these contracts are for a four-year period and how we can, um, you know, continue to enhance, innovate, and really look towards the future. So we're really excited about implementing um, this next round of RFPs um, and then also um, getting started on the next round after that. Um, just wanted to um, also talk very briefly about our work with the Mayor's Office of Talent and the Mayor's Office of, of you know, People with Disabilities. Um, serving job seekers with disabilities is a key priority, both of the Adams administration and SBS and our partners. Um, you know, uh, Assistant Commissioner Joan Sa has been leading a lot of work um, in this area in collaboration with talent and with MOPD. Um, you know, for, for example, um, um, bringing on a staff for an initiative called Scion, um, which really um, is a multi-agency initiative that, you know, seeks to break barriers, any barriers there are to employment with, you know, people with, you know, disabilities, whether they're structural, whether they're policy oriented, whether they're the way that, or, uh, that, the way that agencies work together. 
Um, and, um, you know, MOPD runs an initiative called Jobs at Work, which is direct, um, you know, placement and employment assistance services for job seekers who have disabilities. And, um, you know, recently for the first time, some of that team has been posted directly in our Workforce One centers. Um, so we're really, really excited about that and looking forward to enhancing that particular collaboration. Um, and, you know, there are some strategic priorities, I would say, more broadly for the division. Um, you know, one strong one is an increased emphasis on community engagement and on business development. Um, one big part of our community engagement strategy is enhancing our support for the Jobs NYC initiative, which um, you're likely familiar with. Um, it's, an, it's an initiative led by the mayor and the first deputy mayor um, with strong involvement by New York City talent and other city agencies, including SBS, around really looking at the neighborhoods in New York City where there's high unemployment among people of color and you know, seeking to you know, tackle that issue. Um, which is which is you know been a concern for a long time and you know really needs to be addressed. Uh, so there's been a series of large hiring halls throughout the city, um, you know really bringing in employers, really bringing in services, community partners, um, and SBS is very excited about uh, taking an enhanced role in that initiative in fiscal year 2025. Um, you know, really taking a stronger role as some of the board members were asking about and um, Assistant Commissioner Jones uh, alluded to, um, taking an enhanced role in business development, really making sure that we um, increase the number of employers that are in our system, increase the diversity of jobs. Um, so we'll be strengthening. We already have formed a dedicated business development team very recently and we'll be strengthening it. Um, you know, really continuing our new New Yorker work, um, you know, that work for our asylum seekers and recent immigrants, you know, having the recognition um, that it's not something separate, it's not something that it's going to be temporary, um, but building on the work um, of our um, Washington Heights Center, which Assistant Commissioner Jones discussed briefly, um, really making sure that our system is well prepared um, to not only meet the needs of our new New Yorker job seekers with work-related services, but work-adjacent services, you know, things like ESL, GED prep classes, um, and, you know, really those things that are essential to work, which, which may not, you know, be specifically related to a sector or job, but are um, extremely important to helping our new New Yorkers get job. And, you know, just overall outreach and visibility efforts, you know, looking at things more on a neighborhood level, more on a community level, um, making sure uh, that we're out in every community, that um, individuals are aware of Workforce One and the Workforce One brand, um, really enhancing our marketing and outreach efforts. So it's been such a pleasure of um, presenting this to you today, and we welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you. And I'll turn it back to my colleague, Chris. Great. Thanks so much, Yuri. Uh, and thanks to you and your colleagues. We are going to not pause yet for questions. I know that there were some in the chat that we tried to provide a preliminary response to. We do want to make sure there's enough time for our colleagues at the Department of Youth and Community Development to speak. So we'll let them go. And then we will pause for Q&A um, for both SBS and DYCD after they're done. So I will now turn it over to my colleagues at DYCD. And Adolfo, do you mind bringing up the deck? Great. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everybody. I'm Valerie Mulligan. I'm the Deputy Commissioner uh, for Youth Workforce Programs at the Department of Youth and Community Development. Um, really excited to see many of you here again and excited to see those of you who are new to this space. Um, we can go to the next slide. Before I turn it over to my team, I wanted to set the stage a little bit about what DYCD does and where the WIOA funding fits into our larger mission. So we are the city's lead agency for youth employment programs. We have a whole portfolio of programs of which our WIOA programs fit into. Um, we serve young people between the ages of 14 and 24, and all of our programs help them gain work experience, further education, and then, of course, find job placements. Um, as Chris alluded to, um, but particularly important for DYCD, everything we do as an agency in the workforce space and even beyond is done uh, in partnership with community-based organizations. So we really see our role on my team as setting the vision, the policy, and the partnerships with those community-based organizations to make sure that the, the programs are successful on the ground. Um, and, you know, we'll talk specifically about our WIOA programs here, but I just wanted to say that the agency and our team as a whole are really moving to think of these WIOA programs and these WIOA funds as an opportunity for us to 
uh, create the system Chris had alluded to earlier. So we're not just thinking one-off WIOA programs. We're thinking about how do these WIOA funds supplement what the city is trying to do, the goals we're trying to achieve across the board. How do they fit in? Um, how do we leverage all of the funding that we have um, in our division to make sure that we're we're making the most impact in the workforce space? So with that, I will turn it over to um, Assistant Commissioner Megan keenan Berryman to walk you through what our specific all funded programs are. Thank you, Val. Um, I'm Megan keenan Berryman. I'm the Assistant Commissioner here at DYCD for Workforce Policy, Integration, and Operations. Um, I'm going to just talk briefly about our programs, how they're structured, what they provide, performance, et cetera. So as Chris stated much earlier in the presentation, we have two programs. Um, our program for in-school youth is called Learn and Earn. Um, it serves high school juniors and seniors. Um, everybody who's in this program has to be low income and have a barrier that is defined by WIOA. Um, our other program for opportunity youth or youth who are not working and not in school is called Train and Earn. Um, this program serves young people who are 16 to 24 um, and also have a barrier to employment. So we can move to the next slide. Thank you. So Learn and Earn is really focused on helping high school juniors and seniors stay in school, complete, get their high school diplomas, which is, you know, we think of as like the very first most important uh, workforce credential that you can get. So we want to make sure young people get that and that we have an opportunity to expose them to um, their opportunities post-secondary, uh, that they have an opportunity to get work experience to see what different careers are out there and what sorts of education they might need to take advantage of those. These programs also offer supportive services, guidance and counseling. Um, they're really super comprehensive to just help a young person, a high school student with anything that they might need. And then something that's a feature of both programs is 12 months of follow-up services. So depending on what a young person needs, that might be as simple as, you know, just checking in once a month to make sure everybody's, you know, doing okay and see if there's anything they need. It might be something more comprehensive if someone, you know, goes to college, finds out they need a job, like that kind of assistance can also be provided as part of follow-up. Next slide, please. So I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but eligibility, again, this is defined by WIOA. We added um, New York City residency as an eligibility point for us. Um, everybody in the in-school program has to, again, be low income and have a barrier. This is a long list of barriers, um, but we're really, you know, I think something that's been a nice about WIOA through all of these years is we really are trying to reach and are reaching the most vulnerable young people in New York City. So we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so here's just a little snapshot of our demographics. Uh, we have 55% identifying as female in Learn and Earn. Um, we have a about an equal mix of young people who are Black and Hispanic or Latinx, um, about 20% Asian, and the remainder are white or other. And then the education level is by and large less than a high school diploma. Next slide, please. So for train and earn eligibility, it's a little bit more flexible. Um, the age and the residency are there. Um, if you have one of these barriers that are listed, you don't necessarily have to prove that you are low income unless you already have a high school diploma. So um, the emphasis there is really just trying to get uh, young people in who you know, are past high school age and really need some assistance figuring out what their next step is gonna be. Next slide, please. Our train and earn programs really focus on occupational training. Um, so, you know, the idea there is to get them some training and the 
the sectors for the current contracts include healthcare and tech. Uh, there's some food service training and things like this where a young person can get uh, a credential and go to work fairly quickly without spending, you know, years or a lot of money to get a meaningful credential that will help them in the labor market. There's also a lot of work done on career readiness, work readiness training. Um, everybody can take advantage of a paid work experience. As with the in-school program, supportive services are provided as needed. A big feature of this program um, for out-of-school youth is job placement. And again, everybody gets up to 12 months of follow-up services to assist them with whatever they might need after they're placed um, in a job or in post-secondary. Next slide, please. So the demographics for our OSY program, it's a pretty even 50-50 gender split. Um, race ethnicity, again, is primarily Black, with Hispanic or Latino and Asian being the next biggest groups. Um, and education level, this is interesting to me. This has gone up over the years, but 72% of young people enter this program with a high school diploma or a GED already. Um, so that that can be, that's great because they have the credential, but sometimes we also discover that there's still some remedial work that needs to be done to help people get ready for um, the occupation that, that they're being trained for. So next slide. So this is our performance for the last uh, program year. This is all four quarters. Um, again, we have like SBS, the, the job placement rates in the second and the fourth quarters, um, credential attainment and measurable skills gain. We are doing fine on all of these goals, exceeding every single one, which is awesome. Um, last program year, we enrolled 1,068 young people in the Learn and Earn program and 1,259 in the Train and Earn program. Next slide, please. And I will turn it over to, I think, Artis or Chris from DYCD's Fiscal Shop to walk through the budget slide. Good morning. Good morning, all. Thanks, Megan. Yep. My name is Artis Ann Mogan. I'm the Senior Director for Grants Management here at DYCD. I'm going to be talking briefly about the WIU Youth Budget. Um, as our colleagues talked about, the the WIOA, um, the DYCD WIOA program has a, a follow-up and a direct service component in each city fiscal year. So our budget reflects two program years. Um, the first, the latter program year would be the follow-up services, and the newer program year would be the direct services. Um, and our pro the funds are allocated between the learn and learn programs and the train and learn programs, and together. The, those programmatic components total 87% of the budget. So the, the bulk of our WIOA spending is spent on programs. Technical assistance and administrative um, amounts, which um, add to about 2%, support the WIOA ISY learn and earn and train and earn programs. And those totals add up to 90% of the budget with the DYCD personal services coming in at 10% of the budget. DYCD expects to uh, spend 100% of this budget in City Fiscal 24, not necessarily by June 30 yet, but we will be spending uh, expensive goals. Uh, yeah, I think Kathy's doing that call. Um, yes, sorry, we'll be setting up accruals uh, to spend 100% of this budget. And I just wanted to make a point uh, comparison with SBS. Uh, when SBS talked about their budget and they talked about the fact that the $15 million in their budget covered fringe benefits as well, the DYCD's budget does not include fringe benefit. It only includes salaries and wages for DYCD employees. I just wanted to make that distinction. I'm going to hand it back to Megan if there's any other uh, wheel DYCD slides. Yes, there are a few more slides. All right, so Val is going to talk about our most recent RFP requests. We are winding down our previous set of contracts and getting ready to ramp up the new ones. So Val will talk about that. Sure. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, artists. So 
Um, again, just similar to SBS, CYCD is in the space of, of having the opportunity to re-procure these programs and really bring them into the where we want them to be. So many of you were involved in the process of developing these RFPs. We released a concept paper in September 2023. Um, we did a lot, I mean, an incredible amount of really exciting stakeholder engagement with employers, providers, young people, with all of you, stakeholders across the board to inform the RFPs that were eventually released in April. And we are really at the finish line uh, of the procurement process. We hope to release the awards by the end of this month and then start uh, organize, uh, start onboarding all of our new providers throughout the fall as we, we launch these new programs. You can go to the next slide. So I wanted to highlight a few of the sort of vision moving pieces that that we've implemented through these RFPs. So Learn and Earn has been an in-school, literally an in-school program, meaning that our providers are partnered with DOE schools. Um, this program is, we love this program. I think it's a secret gem across the city because it's really comprehensive. And it's one of these programs that does a really great job of uh, partnering providers with schools and then leveraging what both of those groups have to offer to have the most impact for young people. So we are doubling down on that, that in-school approach. Um, all of our new programs will be in schools and we spent a great deal of time thinking about what schools we wanted to focus on. And that was by looking at a number of factors like um, economic needs index, as well as programming that DOE has been launching over the last few uh years and how our programming uh, supplements or adds to what they are adding into schools as well. Um, and then in the train and earn space, which is the next slide, um, this program, I think we've shifted a little bit more dramatically um, to, to, to be intentionally sector focused. We released competitions in five sectors, healthcare, media and entertainment, government, infrastructure, and technology. Um, we really emphasize in this RFP and in the way that we've evaluated the proposals, providers who are coming to us with partnerships, with credentials, and with um, supportive services all in place already. Um, and we are adding and leveraging funding to make sure we have paid work experiences included in the program. Both of these programs we're really excited about, um, and we will be coming to all of you hopefully very soon with uh, the final place that we landed in terms of the awards that we're going to make in this, uh, in both programs. So I think I will turn it back to Chris from here and happy to take any questions. Great. Thanks Val. And thanks, uh, to the entire team from our youth and community development. I know that the chat was blowing up a little bit. Um, but let's see if there are questions for either um, SBS or DYCD about the adult or youth wheel programs. Um, and I see that Henry has his hand up. So go ahead, Henry. Yeah, forgive me, but I'm a little confused. So an RP is issued for the entirety of the workforce ones early this year. It is extended through a negotiated acquisition. We're going through a final selection. Negotiated acquisition seems to end September according to the city record. Are we doing a second round of, of, of RFP? Are we doing it like bifurcating by agency? Or did I get this wrong? Um, Yuri, Janine. Sure, I, I, mean, I mean, I think it's two, right? So it's two separate RFPs, right? So um, the amazing DYCD team, and I think they're, they're you know, truly amazing. We love working with them, um, have done their RFP. Um, SBS is doing our RFP, um, right? I mean, we, you know, have consulted with each other. We have, um, HRA actually was doing an RFP too. So the um, workforce development teams of the different agencies do regularly consult with each other. Um, so we make sure that we're coordinated, but the RFPs are separate. You know, ours at SBS, we just received um, proposals, um, not to get too into the weeds technically, but we had three different competitions. One was um, for the hub centers and some of the neighborhood centers. Another one was for the two specialized centers that Janine mentioned, um, the one for 
um, for, 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 for immigrants in Washington Heights and for young people in West Farms. Um, and then another one for the ITCs and the Healthcare Career Sector Center. Um, and we're currently reviewing um, those proposals. Um, and like I said, we anticipate hopefully to have them up and running um, you know, by, um, you know, calendar year 2025, you know, early in 2025. And of course, Val just um, discussed in some detail um, the DYCD process as well. Um, I don't anticipate for the SBS process there being any second rounds. Um, what we do is we collect all the proposals, review them, um, you know, by the different competitions, the three competitions that I just talked about. Um, you know, expert reviewers are assigned, uh, you know, rubric of what they need to look at. They score each proposal. Um, usually, um, although there are some limited exceptions that I'll lead to the procurement experts to talk about, but usually the highest scoring proposals are selected um, and, and we negotiate terms. Once that happens, we negotiate terms with each of the vendors um, and then, you know, come to an agreement on, you know, price. And then there's a whole process with the comptroller's office that we have to go, you know, through after that. Henry, did you say you were seeing something about a negotiated acquisition for the Workforce One Centers? That's what I heard you say. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, so the period ending September 24 seems to be posted online beginning March okay. for several Workforce Centers extension. Oh, the so there may be... I can, I can like speak to that. So um, great question. Okay. I know exactly what you're speaking about now. So um, the initial, um, when we first, when we last RFP'd the you know, centers, it was more than five years ago. Um, and during, because of the, you know, pandemic and some, you know, changes in leadership, changes in, you know, vision, um, you know, enhanced thinking about workforce, um, the city, uh, SBS and the city were not ready to re-RFP um, when the initial term, term expired several years back. Um, so what we've done is we've done a negotiated acquisition with which is allowed the contracts have built into them. You, you can do several extensions for this very reason. Um, they can be they're usually done in, in you know, one year batches uh, for one year. Um, so we've done that. Um, I, I know Ishmael and Justin, who are on the call, can speak to it a bit more. We've done it several times. Um, and this last time will like, be the last time. Um, but um, those are just showing up on the system now. Um, so the extensions that extend through um, September 30th of this year, um, so September 30th, 2024 are just going through. It actually takes some time. Those are actually backdated. Um, and then we will be extending it one last time um, through about the middle of 2025, just to give us enough overlap um, so we can get the new contract started. Um, but we informed our three existing um, Workforce One Career Center vendors um, that in all likelihood um, that the new contracts will get started far earlier than the middle of 2025. We just want to have that, you know, overlap just in case. Thank you. Okay. Other questions for either SBS or DYCD? Um, I, I was curious about the um, 23% of people served were um, 18 to 24. And if you, you know, what percentage of those folks obtain employment and where do you typically see them uh, getting employment? You're saying that's for the SBS Workforce One system? Yeah, I know, so that was 23%. Uh, we could take this offline and just but you're interested in that age group, the 18 to 24 yeah. year olds and what yeah. percentage of them get connected to jobs. SBS, I'm guessing you may not have that right now, but we could circle yeah. back with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we can, I don't have that at, at my fingers right now, but I absolutely will be happy to share out um, some breakdowns of uh, uh, customers served by different uh, breaks and so forth. And just to emphasize, I think, you know, SBS is very concerned about that population group. And in fact, as I think Janine mentioned, the West Farm Center 
specifically targets um, out of school, out of work, young adults between 18 and 24. Um, so this is a population that, that that SBS definitely looks at and makes a priority. Other questions? I know we had a bunch of stuff in the chat. I think we responded to most of them, but please, if we didn't answer your question, flag it for us now. We're getting to the home stretch, folks. So um, really appreciate um, everybody's questions and continued engagement. Um, we still do have some slides left. That's why we scheduled it for two hours. Um, and thank you. Um, but just want to let you know we are we are getting into the home stretch. Uh, I see John Calvelli has his hand raised. Go ahead, John. Yeah, it's, I was actually curious. I, it's really exciting and interesting what DYCD and SBS are doing individually as as agencies. How, could you talk a little bit maybe about what you're doing together? Like how how are you dealing with those populations that overlap? How are you dealing with just kind of uh, breaking down silos when appropriate? I'm going to start this and I'll turn it over. Um, I think one of the innovations, shall we say, of the Adams administration and one of the purposes of empowering the our office of NYC talent is really to help foster the partnership amongst agencies. Um, and while agencies have always worked together, now it's sort of been identified as a key priority, particularly given the overlapping populations that we're seeing. Um, and so just want to sort of highlight that it's something we've investigated. It was one of the reasons why we came out with the um, the plan for um, youth career success. Um, and we're continuing to sort of foster the partnerships um, between these two agencies, but also um, with the Human Resources Administration that also does a lot of um, career services. Um, that said, as Chris alluded to before and Yuri as well, um, SBS and DYCD have a long history of working together. So I'll turn it over to them. Sure. Um, ju ju just want to say, um, Abby, Joe, and the Mayor's Office of Talent have been amazing partners. Um, it's, you know, really, we, um, you know, work with them very closely to, you know, coordinate work across all of the city agencies related to workforce development, not just DYCD and, and, and like SBS, but also HRA, New York City Aging. Um, there are a variety of, 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 you know, agencies, as many board members know well, that do workforce in New York City. So, you know, talent really is the glue that, you know, brings us all together, um, helps us engage in policy conversations, cross-agency collaboration. You know, I think a good example of that is the Jobs NYC initiative, which I talked about earlier. Um, it's really all the city workforce agencies, DYCD, SBS, HRA, Department for the Aging, others, um, coming together um, to really address unemployment in targeted neighborhoods. Um, so that's, you know, definitely, definitely one example. Um, I would say that, um, you know, um, and I would like to give DYCD credit where credit is due. They are amazing partners. Um, we enjoy working with them very much. Um, I, you know, Valerie and I, for example, talk policy and cross-agency coordination all the time. Our teams have a strong working relationship. You know, I, I would say one of the areas that we've started talking about, especially since, you know, I alluded to earlier in my, in my presentation or, you know, in, in answering one of the questions that um, DYCD, SBS and HRA, um, you know, all had RFPs come out at the same time. Um, you know, so, you know, one of the conversations that we've, you know, started to have and, you know, talent has been at the center of these two is as we're looking towards the future, um, how can we, um, you know, even though there isn't a lot of duplication, how can we increase efficiencies even further? You know, if we have centers that are close to each other, if we're sharing space, um, kind of how can we enhance resources even more um, so we get them to our, you know, job seekers? Um, so it's a conversation that we're going to continue to have. Um, I think um, there is, um, we, 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 you know, definitely, for example, with DYCD, um, you know, with our youth center in West Farms, um, you know, share um, some of the same responsibilities for the same clients. Um, and, and with HRA, for example, we also serve a lot of clients that are um, involved um, with the public assistance system. Um, so we've started conversations in earnest that talent has helped coordinate, um, you know, over the past six months or so, and we're going to continue to have um, like I said, um, how we can share services, how we can share resources, 
um, how we continue collaborating on initiatives like Jobs NYC. Um, and I think, I'm sure that my colleague um, Val has other examples of this, but we work together very closely. Yeah, and I was just going to say, we actually um, engage in monthly meetings. We've been doing that for about six months at this point and really talking across different divisions to figure out where those synergies lie. So um, working with different coordinators, making sure that they're aware of our programming, having more formal um, referral processes, and we've connected them to our West Farm Center specifically, where we've engaged in uh, a couple of um, off-site recruitment events where we were able to bring services to some of the job seekers that they serve. So it's ongoing. Great. Um, I know there's still remaining questions, but we do need to move on. I want to be mindful of everybody's time, but thank you all for your engagement. And John, this is a great question because it goes to the heart of how do we how do we foster better coordination and alignment uh, across agencies and not just SBS and DYCD, but other agencies involved in the workforce space. Um, so we're going to go to the next portion of the deck. Very mindful that we have seven minutes left in our time. So Adolfo, if you could just please bring up the slide deck. Um, and we're going to talk about roles and expectations of the board and members. Um, and I'm going to go pretty fast through some of these slides um, and we will find a way to make these available to make the content available to you uh, just because we're going to be moving fast. So very briefly, governance under WIOA is through boards. There's a state level board and then we have our local workforce development board, which is this board. Next slide. Um, very briefly in context, there are 600 local boards across the United States, 33 in New York state. We're one of 33. We're the biggest local board in terms of, I believe we have the largest population. We certainly have the largest budget of any local board in the United States. Next slide. So under WIOA, um, the, the law gives a certain purpose to the board and the vision it's really for the board to serve as a strategic leader and a convener of key stakeholders in the broader workforce development system um, and envisions that the role is to partner with local employers and the, the workforce development system. That is to say the, the providers that serve New Yorkers, that provide skill training, that connect people to jobs uh, and to develop policies and to invest we owe dollars in ways that help support the regional economy that develop effective approaches like sector-based partnerships and career pathways, and that are focused on uh, building and maintaining and improving high-quality customer-centered service delivery. Next slide. Okay, so as some of you know, WIOA requires a certain composition for each local board. There's a similar composition requirement for the state board, but in the local board, members are appointed by the chief local elected official. And in our case in New York City, that's obviously the mayor. We must have a business majority that is representatives from businesses. Um, they can, that can also include organizations that represent businesses like we have five, we have uh, chambers of commerce uh, on the board. We have a partnership for New York City. We have the uh, NY Job CEO Council. In addition, we must have at least 20% of the board uh, comprising workforce members. And that means either organizations that are labor organizations or providers involved in directly delivering workforce services. Then there are some additional required members under WIOA in a variety of areas like higher education, um, economic development, and a few others. But this is the, these are the basic requirements for the board. Next slide, please. So WIOA requires, um, record, WIOA lays out 13 um, different roles for the local board. I'm not going to go through all 13, although uh, we may want to go through those at a, at a future date when we have a little bit more time. But essentially, the board is responsible for establishing the plan, the goals, and the budget around WIOA. It is responsible for selecting the service providers. Um, and as we talked about before, the city has a very well-prescribed procurement process that we must follow by law. And so the, the board, rather than selecting the service providers directly, really sort of designates or certifies that 
the city followed the right procedure and selected the providers through an appropriately competitive process. Um, the third role of the board is to convene and coordinate with key partners. Uh, that includes employers, but that also includes other partners in education, state partners like the New York State Department of Labor is a really important partner in our work. Uh, state agencies that work with folks with disabilities like Access VR, um, which is Vocational Rehabilitation, Commission for the Blind, and others. Next slide, please. Um, the board also is responsible for performing oversight, program and fiscal oversight for youth programs and adult programs. Um, and I should say, too, that this, this is a, a long list of items, and it has been, you know, it, it is entirely acceptable that staff to the board, NYC Talent, and the agencies, SBS and DYCD, do perform some of these roles on behalf of the board. We are, we, the board can delegate some of these responsibilities that are uh, time consuming to us as the staff to the board and to SBS and DYCD. So another element of oversight is annually assessing the physical and programmatic accessibility of all of our one-stop centers, the Workforce One Career Centers, to make sure they're fully accessible to all New Yorkers, especially New Yorkers with disabilities. Um, the fifth role of the board under WIO is to drive innovations in program and operations. Uh, and the sixth is to conduct data analysis and to disseminate best practices. Uh, next slide, Chris, please. Chris, I'm giving you the two minute yes, warning. We've already I'm had people very for aware. two hours. I am very aware. Um, let's skip this slide for now. Um, just a couple last notes, and I think some of you are very aware of this. The board is subject to the open meetings law in New York State. The board is a public body, and the public has a right, because we're a public body, to, to listen to debate and watch the decision-making process. So when we have our four quarterly board meetings, they must be advertised in advance. They're open to members of the public. They take place in person. We need an in-person quorum to conduct business, and we video record and then post the sessions afterwards. Just want to make that clear. Next slide. Um, formal roles of board members. Um, when members are on committees with council and board members, board members must chair the committees. We ask members to vote at in-person meetings on an, a range of matters like electing the board chair, the annual WIOA budget, newer updated policies, funding transfers, and approving meeting minutes. The executive committee exists and it can make decisions on behalf of the full board. Um, and then we also have bylaws, which we will share with you as a follow-up uh, to this conversation. Um, so I'm going to stop there because we are at time. Um, we covered a lot of information today. Um, we, we hope we delivered on a promise to give you a deep dive into WIOA. Um, and we had a lot of questions that came through. We've been tracking those. We will try to respond to everything. Um, we may take a few minutes at our next quarterly meeting, um, which will be October 10th um, at a location still to be determined because we've had a couple fall through and we want to get a really big space for that meeting. Um, and we encourage you in the meantime, please participate and attend your your committee meetings. I think everybody is assigned to one of the committees and we will be following up with a few documents uh, for you to review to help you better understand certain elements. Of WIOA. So I want to thank my um, colleagues at NYC Talent. I want to thank my colleagues at Small Business Services and the Department of Youth and Community Development for presenting today. Um, and I want to thank all of you for your time and attention. We really appreciate you sitting with us for two hours today um, and really appreciate you engaging and asking great questions. Um, about how all of this works. This is not the final conversation. It's really the first, um, but we appreciate you uh, going on this journey with us today. So thanks everybody and have a great yeah. rest of your week. Abby, you want to say anything? Yeah, thanks everybody. And also um, we always up for reauthorization. So we will do a follow-up call um, soon, um, particularly when we have a clear action item. So look for that on your calendars. It may show up in August, just FYI, but we'll try to see if we can um, wait till September, but that is coming up this fall um, quickly, as many of you know. Awesome, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care, have a good rest Thanks, of your week. Thanks, Chris, Thank great you. job.